I'm David Moses Bridges, and I'm Pastor McQuaddy from Zubayeg Reserve. Birch bark canoes go back about 3,500 years ago. Uh, they were developed by the ancestors, and that was a continuing tradition from 3,500 years ago right up until the generation of my great-grandfather, Sylvester Gabriel. Uh, my great-grandfather passed away in 1972 when I was 10 years old and left me his tools and patterns and left me with the inspiration to do what we always wanted to do one but he was very old and I was very young but but he put it in my heart so later in life I chose to study naval architecture and traditional boat building to try to get an idea of what I was looking at and, and playing around with birch bark trying to get a feel for it when I went to learn birch bark canoes there was nobody in my community that made birch bark canoes it's a tradition that came this far from becoming a lost art and that was very sad to me. I think it's a defining aspect of our culture and I felt that it was very important for those aspects of our culture to be preserved. I began teaching workshops with native groups in indigenous communities, Wabanaki communities, showing them the processes of gathering, the processes of digging up the roots, processing the roots, uh, gathering the cedar, splitting the cedar, carving the cedar, finding the birch, showing them what's good and what's bad, uh, what you want to avoid and what you want to look for. These are the important aspects of canoe building that need to be passed to the next generation. But the real trick in making canoes is gathering the materials, gathering quality materials. When you look at a canoe, the first thing you notice is the stylistic differences. Uh, really, most of them have the same construction techniques, uh, cedar, spruce root, birch bark and some type of hardwood maple or white ash for the thwarts and the pegs and the paddles. There's really quite a bit of time spent in searching for material and in searching for quality material. Testing trees, looking for bark that's like this. You have to have an intimate knowledge of what type of forest you're in. You have to have a, uh, a relation with the trees to understand what the, what the good material is going to be. It, it's rough terrain to travel over, it really is. It's uh, thick forest uh, interspersed with bodies of water that need to be traversed, rivers that connect the lakes, rivers that flow to the sea, islands offshore that are only accessible by a good solid boat that's designed for use on the water. So the canoes were developed in response to this condition of the, of the land. You have to have a boat that's light because when you get to the end of one body of water you need to carry that boat. This boat here weighs 55 pounds when it's dry but it'll carry about six or seven hundred pounds of gear and no specialized tools are required other than a crooked knife uh, which historically would have been made from a split beaver tooth, uh, wooden wedges to split all of the cedar, no special tools required to dig up the roots or prepare the roots. It's solid, it's, it's, it's really beautiful stuff and it's flexible. Subarin is a waxy acid. Lignin is what gives wood its stiffness. The low percentage of lignin makes it flexible and the bituanol is a hydrophobic type of oil which means waterproof. So birch bark is waterproof. Uh, not that any of that matters to the old builders. All they knew is that it was the perfect material for what they wanted. It's, uh, it's a beautiful tradition. It's something that helps maintain our tribal identity in a modern world. And, and I want the next generation to be able to look at this and thank their ancestors for all of their efforts. And I hope I can just be a small part of it by showing what I know.